Hello, this is Melissa Cross uh, with Grand Canyon University for uh, Bio 515. This week we're talking about the endocrine system, and this presentation is going to be focused on vasopressin and oxytocin. Okay, so the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary make up a complex pair of neuronal cell bodies. So the hypothalamus, which is this green section right up here, and the posterior pituitary, as you can see, they're like directly connected. The hypothalamus influences the actions of the posterior pituitary. Um, it is thought evolutionarily that there, it is just an elongation of the hypothalamus. Um, within that hypothalamus, connecting to the posterior pituitary, we have these neuronal cell bodies. Um, within the hypothalamus, there are two nuclei. So we have the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus. And both of these produce the oxytocin and vasopressin. They are then packaged by the Golgi and they're sent through this connecting stalk here to be stored in the posterior pituitary. So these nuclei end with the neuronal terminals in the posterior pituitary, and these are going to release the vasopressin and oxytocin into the general circulatory system, where they will go and act on what the um, organs that they need to act on. And we'll get into that in the following slides. So, like I mentioned, the posterior pituitary does not actually make the hormones. Rather, this is done in the hypothalamus by the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus. Um, the pituitary just stores the hormones until they are to be released. So, although these hormones are made and stored in these areas, only one is released at a time. And when they um, are both needed, they serve different purposes. Okay, so let's start with vasopressin. So vasopressin actually has two names and two jobs. We have vasopressin, and it is also called antidiuretic hormone. So as you can tell from the two names, it gives you a clue in as to what their jobs are. So if we're starting with vasopressin, this clues us into the fact that this hormone recruits smooth arteriolar muscle contraction, which ultimately results and vasoconstriction. So this helps the body maintain blood pressure and also increases systemic vascular resistance. The other important job of this hormone is acting to reabsorb water through the kidneys, which creates this antidiuretic effect, decreasing urine volume, hence the name antidiuretic hormone. As shown in this diagram, vasosuppressin has three different receptor types located throughout the body. The V1 receptor, as designated here, is responsible for the pressure effect on arterioles and is also found in the gastrointestinal tract smooth muscle. So this helps with the contraction of our blood vessels in that gastrointestinal smooth muscle. The V2 receptor, shown here, is going to help with that kidney fluid absorption and it mediates the antidiuretic effect and is located in the basolateral membrane of the principal cells of the collecting tubule of the nephron and these nephrons are located in the kidneys. A third receptor, the V3 receptor not located on this diagram, is present in anterior pituitary corticotrophs where it mediates a minor control in the increased secretion of adrenocorticotropin. So this is just another hormone um, usually having to do with adrenaline. So one disorder that is connected with vasosuppressin is diabetes. So the decreased availability of vasosuppressin leads to something called diabetes insipidus. There are two types of diabetes, diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus. 
Insipidus means tasteless in reference to the urine produced by these patients, unlike diabetes mellitus, meaning sweet urine due to the excess glucose present in these patients' urine samples. One symptom of diabetes insipidus is the inability to concentrate urine and conserve water due to the decreased activity of vasosuppressin, and this is formally called polyuria. So this is going to affect these V2 receptors. Uh, these patients are not going to be able to absorb that fluid due to decreased amount of vasosuppressin. Um, so the kidneys won't be able to absorb that fluid. We're going to have a decreased blood volume, and that's going to cause the patient to urinate excessively. Our other hormone, oxytocin. So oxytocin is released in response to increased levels on estrogen from sensory responses from the uterus during delivery and suckling during breastfeeding. So these, this hormone is released from sensory stimulation, um, either by the uterus or by the breast tissue. Um, as shown in the picture, and we'll get to this later, it is also um, in response to sensory stimulation um, from the penis through men to ejaculate. Um, oxytocin actually works as a positive feedback loop, resulting in more oxytocin produced, which results in faster labor or milk secretion until the process is completed. This is unlike many other hormones who regulate on a negative feedback loop when too much of one hormone is produced and another has to be secreted to stop that first hormone from being circulated. So oxytocin is actually destroyed in the gastrointestinal tract when provided orally. So this requires an injection or a nasal spray of synthetic oxytocin um, to induce labor and facilitate progression of labor. Um, other uses for this hormone could include assisting lactation in cases of insufficient milk ejection and controlling postpartum uterine hemorrhage and involution. As mentioned before, oxytocin um, is involved in making ejaculation. This happens when a burst of oxytocin is released from the anterior pituitary into general circulation, which stimulates contractions of the reproductive organs, um, similar to that in females, but in this case aids in sperm release. So that oxytocin burst acts on um, some seminiferous tubules, the epididymis, and the prostate gland. Aside from the actual release of oxytocin, we also have social effects of oxytocin on the brain. So oxytocin is also a neurotransmitter in the brain and acts in such actions and aids in such actions such as learning new information as well as social learning due to regulation of excitatory and inhibitory balances. Oxytocin in conjunction with other neurotransmitters such as serotonin can also help create bonds and attachment between individuals such as a mother and baby or two people in a relationship. Decreased levels of oxytocin have been shown in people with such conditions as autism, borderline personality disorder, and those who exhibit unrestricted eating habits, leading to obesity. These are my references. Thank you for listening.